the book of Judges, chapter number 16. We are winding down the book of Judges. In fact, the judge that we're going to wind down on tonight is the last judge mentioned in the book of Judges, although there are still five chapters after this chapter. Um, it's really, I mean, the next judge that we know anything about is in the book of Samuel, Eli and uh, Samuel. But uh, Samson pretty much finished off Israel with his, uh, his judgeship. And as we've already seen, he was one of the most uh, rebellious uh, judge, if not the most rebellious judge. He, uh, he lived his life doing the opposite of what he should have done. And whatever God told him to do in the Nazarite vow, why he didn't uh, do much except let his hair grow and keep it. He didn't shave his head. That's about the only thing he didn't do. Now, there were a couple occasions when he violated his Nazarite vow that in order to repent, he would have to shave his head and go back through it again. Uh, but he didn't do that. And yet, when it all come down, came down to it, God had his head shaved for him. <laughs> and, uh, and so he eventually had to get to a place where he repented. Uh, and uh, we don't know, he never, he never one time offered repentance with his lips as far as the Bible reveals. He, uh, he did, uh, uh, and you know, there were, like I say, we went through the formula over there in the book of Numbers uh, where it gives the thing, if a Nazarite violate his vow, well, then there's a formula for him to get it right. And uh, he never did that. He, he, in the end, it was done to him, but he never did. And God uh, said he was supposed to sacrifice uh, uh, a she-lamb, uh, a he-lamb, and a ram. And, uh, and so uh, it turns out the, the Lord got his wife, as that was his, apparently his sacrifice. It wasn't Samuel's sacrifice, but God took the, his wife as the she-lamb, uh, her father as the he-lamb, and now he's the ram. He's the one that butts head with everybody, Samson did. So he's, he's the one that's going to be taken. So it's like what the Lord's word said concerning getting right with him when you violate it, uh, it was done to him. <laughs> he wouldn't do it, so it was done to him. And uh, the application of that is for the rebellious child of God whom the Lord loveth. He chasteneth every son whom he receiveth. He scourgeth every son. Look, we all sin and come short of the glory of God. And uh, bottom line is, uh, if you belong to the Lord, he's going to whip you. That's just the way it goes. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, the whipping literally is a is a characteristic of being his. We don't whip other people's children, or we're not supposed to. It's against the law. But, uh, but we, uh, we take interest in ours. We want ours to do right. We want ours to live right. We want ours to follow the rules. And uh, parents uh, mold those uh, and, and work with their kids. Uh, but uh, uh, Samson never learned that lesson. He belonged to the Lord. He, he literally had been dedicated unto the Lord before he was born. And yet, of all the people that wouldn't accept, now he took the benefits. You know, he had the great benefits. He was given a position of power and influence. He had great strength. He enjoyed supernatural uh, strength that God had given him. But he never got serious at all about what God had called him to do and had committed him to do. And so that's why when we read his life, it, it is a tale of sad ways. It's a tale of a Christian and his journey not ever getting to the point where they, uh, what I believe would be totally surrendered. Uh, you know, he may surrender his hand, but he didn't surrender his foot. Uh, he may surrender his arm, but he didn't surrender his leg. So uh, in some respects, he is a illustration of every Christian, uh, every New Age, uh, New Testament age Christian. 
not New Age Christian, but every New Testament age Christian. Man, I tell you what, if you don't watch your words there. But uh, so it says, uh, uh, the last verse in chapter 15, he judged Israel in the days of the Philistines 20 years, as though that was it for him. Isn't that the end of his life? Well, it was though God put that in there, in my mind, to depict that he was finished with him uh, in that area of being a leader of the children of Israel. He had, he had just continued to um, make wrong choices. Uh, he, got, he whipped all those Philistines with the jawbone of an ass. Then he, then he said, oh Lord, I'm dying of thirst. And the Lord miraculously brought water out of that jawbone. And he drank out of that and quenched his thirst. It's funny how Samson had one crisis after another. One battle after another. One of being attacked after another. Which is a depiction uh, for the Christian soldier when he's told to put on the whole armor of God. Because all your life, uh, this idea that somehow you're going to arrive in your Christian life where you're no longer under attack, uh, not so. Samson had to fight all his days. And uh, the child of God, you know what? You know when you finally win the victory? At death. <laughs> hey, oh grave, where, oh death, where is thy sting? Oh grave, where is thy victory? It's gone. You get the victory through the Lord Jesus Christ. But until you die physically, uh, you're going to be in battle after battle after battle after battle. And they, sometimes they get exceedingly more. They may start out with a small thing. You fight and set somebody's fields on fire, but in the end, man, they're waiting outside every gate to attack you. Just like the Philistines did for Samson. They slept by the city gate so that when Samson would come out in the morning, they were going to jump him and kill him. And remember what he did there? He grabbed those gates, tore them off uh, the posts of the city to post. He took with them the gates, the chains. It said that uh, those city gates could weigh as much as 4,000 pounds. He hauled them between 20 and 40 miles. Not real sure about that, but somewhere uh, some believe it was 20, others believe it was 40. And at the end, he, he went up a hill with those city gates. And you know, for him to do that, he probably had to kill all those fellows that were laying in wait for him outside the gates, which violated his Nazarite vow. He wasn't supposed to kill those people. Uh, and uh, so either way, he lived a life of mistake-ridden, uh, failure, Success, reward, failure, defeat, victory, success, failure. It kind of sounds like somebody's been saved for many, many years. <laughs> Just up and down. Uh, you know, things, you think things are getting better. And uh, I remember it says, uh, uh, cheer up, things could be worse. And I cheered up and things did get worse. I saw that on a little sign one time somebody had on a mirror. Uh, so uh, is that a doom and gloom? No, I think it's not doom and gloom. I think it, it is a reality check. Uh, these, we Christians get the idea that you get saved, you start reading the Word of God, you start growing, and everything turns out fine. And that is not true. <laughs> Things don't turn out fine all the time. Now, thank God he gives you the grace to get through the trials and tribulations. But it doesn't take them away. And, uh, but yet I, I do hear this philosophy that somehow if, you're, if you do what you think's right, that, you, that should, uh, that should uh, cancel all your problems. I had somebody tell me that today. That they try to do right, they, they, they tried to do the right thing, and they, the Lord knows they tried to serve him, and it seems like more trouble comes now than it's ever come. Somebody told me that today. A, a, a Christian who's been saved for many years was down and out, 
Because it just, it, it like, and I thought, well, is it supposed to be different? You know what God does? He gives you a little place to drink water from time to time, like he did Samson, you know. He miraculously provides for you to let you know he's on the throne in your life. But it doesn't stop the Philistines from coming back and getting you. They're going to chase you down to the day you die. And even after you die, they'll be after you. They can't get to you, but they certainly will do everything. Uh, you know, you think about how these uh, uh, worldlings uh, do their own people. They, they build them up in the world, glorify them, and then they wait for them to fall. And even now I've noticed when they bring them down through some, some disappointment that they've done to the world, they bring them down, and then after they die, do you know what they do? They stay after criticizing them, belittling them. And you know, it used to be they said, don't speak bad of the dead. Don't speak evil of the dead. That's out the window with this pagan culture we live in. Uh, they stay after people after they've, they've killed them and buried them. They still get after them. It's pretty ruthless out there. Uh, uh, I, uh, you know, I... I mean, the, the uh, blasphemous way these uh, groups that oppose uh, Christian values now and how they mock uh, Jesus. And I saw one recently where they were praying at the pro-life uh, uh, rally in Washington, D.C. this past week. And uh, one of those uh, abortionists got up in their face and, and blasphemed Jesus right in their face, called him a fake Jesus. Quit praying to your fake Jesus and other things through cursing. And, and I'm thinking, what a miserable wretch, you know. I mean, where are they going? They're going to die one day. Do they have a clue? They, they can't be sure there's no afterlife. They don't know that. Even in their denial, they can't know that there's no afterlife. And so, what a fool to be a blasphemer when, uh, when you don't have any assurance of what's going to happen when you die, of anything. You can't even believe enough to believe there's nothing. I mean, God's made you incurable in that area. You can't get the faith to believe there's nothing even when you profess that you believe there's nothing. You have doubt in your heart and fear. Why? Because nobody really who doesn't know about what's going to happen after they die uh, can have any peace. They just can't. Uh, some of the most famous and contemporary famous, this Christopher Hitchens, uh, Higgins, uh, I believe, uh, Christopher Hitchens, who was a, a famous agnostic atheist that used to blast Christianity. As he got near death, he talked about the misery of his condition. <laughs> in the fact that he didn't know. And here he was for 45 years writing books and speaking atheistically and agnostically and mocking Christianity. But when he gets down to the end of die, he's bitter, miserable, and fearful. So what a life to live, huh? Well, these Philistines kept coming after Samson. And Samson, after he gets the victory, you know what the next thing he did? Distress after distress, he gets the victory. God blesses him with uh, the uh, victory over a thousand of the uh, Philistines. And then he gets the water. And then the next thing you see him in chapter 16 and verse number 1, then went Samson to Gaza and saw there an harlot and went in unto her. <laughs> he just got a great victory over the Philistines. And sometimes... Successes breeds depression. He's not the only one. You remember Elijah? He went up on the Mount Carmel and he slew the prophets of Baal. I mean, what a victory. God had blessed him with supernatural strength. And you know the next thing the Bible tells us? He went down and sat under a juniper tree and said, I'll just sit here till I die. Uh, he's not the only one. When the, uh, uh, they, the disciples went, on the, went up on the Mount of Transfiguration with the Lord and uh, they saw that vision of 
the transfigured Lord and Moses and Elijah. And, you know, they were in cloud nine, if you would. They came down. You know what the first thing they encountered? A man whose son was possessed by a devil. <laughs> From the heights of spiritual joy to having to deal with the devil. <laughs> Just like that. So there's, this is taught in the narrative here. God had used him, given him a victory, took care of his needs and his thirst miraculously, but he just couldn't get his heart right. As his problem was with foreign women, unsaved, outlandish, out of the land of Israel, women. He never got over it. And this is not his last stop, as you know, because the most famous one comes after him, <laughs> after her. So he has this rendezvous with immort uh, immorality. And it was told the Gazites. Now, Gaza is that town we're still dealing with. It, the, you know, they call it the Gaza Strip. Uh, Gaza's still there. It was there all through the New Testament. The Lord mentioned it in the book of Matthew and Luke. And here it is way back in Samson's time. Uh, it says he told the uh, it was told the Gazites saying Samson has come hither. They compassed him in, in this town, and laid wait for him all night in the gate of the city, and in the morning, when it is day, we shall kill him. So they're willing to ambush him, and uh, they had a big surprise, did they not? And Samson lay till midnight and arose at midnight. He, he got up. They were going to wait till daylight. They figured he'd get up about 7, come out the gates about 7.38. Now those city gates don't open. Uh, they have to be opened by royal decree. And uh, so they're shut up. I got a kick out of uh, some archaeologist uh, findings today. They, they were digging around the old city of Jerusalem and they they found a, a moat about 30 feet, 30 feet wide and uh, it circled around the old wall and they were talking about all the, uh, how they, they discovered this and, and uh, um, I thought, man, uh, you know, they tried to liken it to, they said it's probably built during the, the Crusader times and, uh, and I doubted that. They, you know, they, they just, they have a hard time when they, when they don't accept the Bible version, they end up they end up identifying things. It appears to me in the wrong era, and then later on, twenty years later, they come up and say, "Oh, we made a mistake." <laughs> but they found this moat, uh, and a lot of these cities had these moats where they uh, Jerusalem never put water in their moat. They just made it where uh, the charging horses or the charging camels would not be able to get to the city gate because they'd fall over into this sometimes 12 to 20 foot deep moat that had no water in it, just something to hinder them from getting inside the gate. Well, Samson, they're laying outside the gate, all these Philistines, or the Gazites, which are Philistines, and, they, and, they, and they're thinking he's coming out when the, you know, when the trumpet's blown and the gate opens and the, everybody gets up and goes to work and you know, traffic starts moving in the city. But he says, no, nah, I mean, he was sort of a sorry guy, too. He, he had this uh, uh, prostitute, and then he, once, he, once he got through with his need, his immoral need, he just got up and left. You know, got up and left at midnight, which was rare. So he comes out. Now, you don't tell me when he jerked the city gates down, those 4,000 pounds, they didn't wake up. I guarantee you they woke up. And I, I believe he probably killed all them. The Bible doesn't necessarily depict it, but how did he get out if they're laying wait outside the gate? How did he get the gate down and walk off with it? Without, I mean, it, somebody had to die on that one. It says, uh, uh, he took the doors of the gate of the city and the two posts and went away with them, bar and all. So, and put them upon his shoulders 
and carry them up to the top of a hill that is before Hebron. And it came to pass afterwards that he loved a woman in the valley of Sorak whose name was Delilah. Uh, after a great victory of supernatural strength being revealed, he falls again. Fools with Delilah. And this is his downfall. Uh, it wasn't something that just happened on him. He had a pattern that got him to this place. He, uh, you know, remember he started out with a woman of tenderness. Remember that? His parents said, leave her alone. He just never got over it. And the lords of the Philistines came up to unto her and said unto her, Entice him, and see wherein his strength lieth, and by what means we may prevail against him, that we may bind him to afflict him. That's the, that's the purpose of the people against God's people, is to do everything they can to bind you and afflict you. Uh, the devil, his demons, his spirits, and those who he uses against the people of God is to bind you and afflict you. And that's what their purpose was, and they stated it. And he said, and we will give the, uh, every one of us 1,100 pieces of silver. So they were going to reward her quite handsomely if she would do this debauched, deceitful act. And of course, you know, there's been a many a guy that got tied up with uh, a woman that wasn't right with God and they did it. They did it to him. And, uh, and Delilah said to Samson, tell me, I pray thee. Uh, didn't take her long, did it? This must be his girlfriend. I mean, he was in love with her. He was smitten. Uh, and she really uh, never really cared about him. But he kept fooling around with the wrong ones. So you know he had it coming, did he not? And she says, Tell me, I pray thee, wherein thy great strength lieth, and wherewith thou mightest be bound to afflict thee. <laughs> can, you, can you believe that? Hey, Samson, give me the info that could make you a candidate to finally have my kinfolk to do an end. Now, you would have think he would have had the sense to say, enough of you. I'm not helping you and your Philistine cousins and uncles and aunts and grandpa. Hey, I, 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 I kill every one of them. But uh, you would have thought he would have run. I mean, this tells you how that sin can eventually hinder your capacity to make any right or sound judgment. Just you know, sometimes you've run into Christians, you served the Lord for years, they got away from God, and they got mixed up with the wrong thing, and next thing you know, you wonder, you know, and then they start talking crazy talk, and they get to where they can't make any real discernment between doctrines and all that, and next thing you know, they're part of everything. <laughs> and you go, one time they loved God and read the Word of God and studied, and then they just quit, and now they're tied up with some crazy bunch that's cultish, and uh, hey, you fool around with sin long enough and it can mess your mind up. And that's what Samson proves. Well, she begs him so that we could kill you. Give us the info. And Samson said unto her, if they bind me with seven green withs that were never dry, that's stems of vines, then shall I be weak and be as another man. And then the lords of the Philistines brought up to her seven green whiz, which had not been dried, and she bound him with them. What a game. I mean, this has got two kids, isn't it? Samson's not a kid at this point. Now there were men lying in wait. There they are again. Those Philistines always lie in wait. I uh, saw today that uh, a famous contemporary Christian songwriter, Amy Grant, had her two, uh, had a lesbian niece and lesbian, two lesbians come to her farm and she 
had the wedding ceremonies performed at her farm. And, uh, and when it was all said and done, she was blasting Franklin Graham and everybody else for standing up saying, look, we don't hate anybody, but here's what the Word of God says about a lifestyle. This is the lifestyle. This is what God says. We don't write the Bible. And boy, uh, of course, everybody comes on you. If, you. if you say anything about the Bible, what the Bible says about murder, you would think they'd call you a murderphobic. Get up and say, you know, thou shalt not kill. You can't be a murderer. Well, why don't they call me a murderphobic? I mean, now, as I mentioned the other day, they're calling um, uh, uh, pedophiles. They want you to call them uh, uh, minor attractive people. Minor attractive. That's what they, they don't want you to make it seem like it's a sinful behavior. We know what God says about it. It's very clear in the Old Testament. Uh, you say, what about New Testament? Well, he, he names it in the passages in the New Testament about uh, all these debauched activities. They're all named. In fact, in the book of Revelation, it lists a bunch of sins and says if these people don't get right and get saved, they're going to die and go to hell. That's what it says. Well, nobody wants to hear that anymore. Nobody. But uh, she, uh, he's playing around with her, and, and, and then they were lying in wait, abiding with her in the chamber. And, and he's a strange thing. She's got him in her house, and she's hiding these murderer and assassins in the back rooms. What kind of... Hey, uh, we got two pictures here. We got the picture of Delilah and her wickedness, but we got to also see that Samson and his weakness. When you get wickedness and weakness together, you got a big problem coming. And uh, they were lying in the wait in her chamber, and she said unto him, The Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And he break the whiz as with a thread of tow is broken when it is toucheth by fire. So his strength was not known. So she never found out. Well, Delilah said unto Samson, Behold, thou hast mocked me. He told her seven, two different things. He said, You mocked me now and told me lies. Now tell me, I pray thee, wherewith thou mightest be bound. Now this is the same girl who said, The Philistines be upon you. <laughs> Nothing happened. Because he duped her. So he's still conversing. I mean, he doesn't have any sense at this point. Zero. No, no discernment. And he says to her in verse number 11, If they bind me fast with new ropes that were never occupied, then shall I be weak and be as another man. And Delilah therefore took new ropes and bound him therewith and said unto him, The Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And there were liars in wait abiding in the chamber. And he brake them from off his arms like a thread. <laughs> So boy, is he toying with her. He thinks it's funny. You know? He doesn't know he's, his end is coming. And Delilah said unto Samson, Hitherto thou hast mocked me and told me lies. Tell me where thou mightest be bound. And he said unto her, If thou weavest seven locks of my head with the web. Notice he's getting closer to the truth. She's, she, he's playing around with sin. And sin's about to get him duped. He's getting closer. He said, You take my my hair, and you you weave them in your loom. <laughs> I don't even, boy, he must have had some. Of course, you see the locks these days, you know, they got the beads and everything, you know, and all down and everybody. You wonder, I mean, it takes a lot of work to do that. Doesn't it take a lot? Sometimes I see some of these folks' hair, and I go, how many hours did that take? That's a lot. It's a work of art that they can do. Well, Samson had that problem apparently so she weaves his hair as she sew on her fall sweater <laughs> she puts his hair in there and runs that cotton all the way through it or whatever that lin uh, uh, linen or whatever and gets his hair tangled up in her crochet and what does he do he gets up and walks out with her crochet her loom and everything that tied it down he walked out the door pulling that thing with his long hair I mean, it's a crazy world. And she still gets him to say, again, I, I tell you, it's gotten pathetic. 
Well, uh, it says that he, in verse 14, and she fastened it with a pin and said unto him, The Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And he awaked out of his sleep and went away with the pin of the beam and with the web. So that's, I guess that's your table that your sewing machine's on <laughs> and, and, and your work. And, uh, and he just went out the door with everything. So, hey, we run out of time, but I'm going to tell you, it goes downhill. As uh, long as we're in the enemy's land, we must expect a battle will follow. As long as we're in the land of the enemy. And like I say, uh, uh, there'll come a day when uh, those golden bells will ring for me and for you. And we won't have to deal with that. That's got to be one of the great things about heaven. There's no more battles. It's over. When the battle's over, we should wear a crown. And, and really all the fighting with the flesh, the devil, uh, and the world. I mean, do you know what it'd be like not to feel? Right now we Christians are being ostracized and talked bad about and evil about. And we're the bad guys of the world. If we just shut up and go away, everything would be fine. That's the drift you get from them. Uh, it's going to be nice in heaven. We're going to be the uh, special people there. You know? <laughs> there won't be nobody blasting us, telling us how sorry of people we are. <laughs> we'll just, you know, it's gonna, that'll be a good part right there. Let's bow our heads. Look forward to seeing you on Sunday. Lord, we thank you for our opportunity to meet tonight. Pray that you'd be with the folks and take care of them and bring them back to us Sunday. In Jesus' name, amen.